think to keep in theme, um, it's amazing my wife and I did not discuss uh, any of her songs with my message, and the title of my message today is A Father's Endless Love. A Father's Endless Love. Um, uh, You have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, chapter 15. I'm going to teach on something today that I've I've never taught on any other Father's Day. I want to talk about the prodigal son. And we call him the prodigal son. The scripture says the lost son. But we've added prodigal to it. Uh, A prodigal means basically a wasteful individual, uh, a person who has a disregard for the value of money. It comes from the Latin roots to mean forth or pro and to drive a jeer. Uh, it indicates the quality of a person who drives forth his money, who wastes it by spending it on reckless abandonment. So that's how we, we get the prodigal part of this. And we know the story well. But I want to talk about the Father's endless love and what does it really look like. I want to give you a little bit of history on what we're seeing here. In chapter 15, verse 1, we see the beginning of this story. We have now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. It says him. So I want you to think about this for a moment. All right, kids, you can go. My, everybody's looking. Thank you. That didn't sound like a kid, but kids, you can go. (laughs) So let me rewind. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) So Luke chapter 15, I want us to really grasp what is being said here. Listen. Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered or grumbled or had, let me give it to you this way, had attitude. And their attitude was basically this towards Jesus. What is is it with you? I mean, you surround yourself with tax collectors. Now, we understand the value of a tax collector to a a Pharisee, a, a A tax collector to any Jew back in that day was considered worse than a Samaritan, was considered the worst of all sinners in the sight of the Jewish people. And Jesus surrounded himself with that. He goes on to say that he surrounded himself not just with tax collectors, they wouldn't put him in the same category as a sinner, but surrounded himself with sinners on top of it. Now, who would have the sinners of that day have been? They would have been the the, the prostitutes. They would have been um, those that were, were earning livings in, in ways that they would have been considered uh, deplorable and, you know, people of drunkardness and, 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 and things of that nature. Even unhealthy people, the sick, were considered sometimes sinners because of the disease that they may have carried. And so we see this, and, and then Jesus starts to tell three different parables. One about the lost sheep, one about the lost coin, and then one about the lost son. Now, what's amazing about this story, if we can understand that those people that were surrounding Jesus were sinners and were tax collectors, even after he just delivered a message so powerful. about what it is to be a follower of Christ. He says this, the cost of being a disciple, starting in verse 25, and I don't want to read that to you now, but if you are able to read it and to grapple with it and understand the depths of it, basically it's saying you better count the cost because I have a high cost for you to follow me. And meanwhile, it didn't scare away the sinners. It didn't scare away the tax collectors. On top of it, I'm going to say this, it went in one ear 
and out the other of the religious leaders of that day. Well, how do I know it? Because what does it say on the last verse here in 15? Excuse me, in uh, 35, uh, 36. He who has an ear to hear, let him what? Hear. How many times have you heard me say that? whether it's here or Wednesday Bible study, because we have to have spiritual ears to hear what the Lord is saying to us. And if we don't, we're never going to get the message. And obviously, the religious leaders of that day didn't get the message. They didn't get the message when Jesus says, listen, I didn't come for the well, but I've come for the sick. They need a physician, and that's me. I am their hope. And who were the sickest people of that day that never heard? The Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders. They thought they had a market on God, but they were horribly wrong. And we read that in Matthew chapter 23 of how wrong they were. And so we see this, we see this story unfolding and and Jesus looked at them and he says, I'm going to tell you three stories. And he's telling these stories about how he goes out and gets the, the, leaves the 99 to get the one lost sheep. He tells about a, a story of a coin and, and how, how and, and again, a parable, a story about basically how God goes out looking for the lost. The things that are, that are unseen, that nobody knows where they are and, and don't care where they are. And that's kind of like society back in that day. The religious leaders didn't care about sinners. They really didn't. They didn't care about the tax collectors. On top of it, they, they, would, they would heap judgment on them. They would heap judgment on the sinners. And sometimes we kind of do that too, right? You know, we don't want to give a time of day if somebody smells kind of funky, right? Maybe less fortunate than us. Maybe, maybe those that are begging for money or for a meal. You know, we don't have a lot of compassion on the, the drug addict or the prostitute. But that's who Jesus is surrounding himself with. Now, what's amazing about the first two parables, and I won't go into any more depth about them, but I want you to remember this. In those parables, Jesus shows how the father went after them, went out looking for them. But not so in the third one, in the parable of the lost son. He waited for that son to return. So if you wouldn't mind, come with me to verse 11 of chapter 15 of the book of Mark, uh, Luke, excuse me, curveball. They would have understood this story and the depths of its meaning. We may not, and I'm going to try to help you see this this morning, of the great insult of this son to the father. So it says this in verse 11, and he said, and this is the younger son, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. So basically, he's demanding his inheritance. Now, we know how inheritance works, right? Usually, you get that after somebody dies, right? So I want you to hear the insult that he's saying to his father. He's saying, Dad, I know you're not dead yet, but whatever it is, I don't care. I want my inheritance now. How do you think that would fly if that was your home? <laughs> Probably first thing I would say, son, come over here. Let me smell your breath. Let me look into your eyes to see if they're bloodshot because there is something definitely not right with you. Now, we, we see this home and we learn, I mean, what, what could have caused this, this, this young man to ask his father in such a disrespectful way? 
Basically, what he's saying to his father here, he wished his father was dead. That's how a Jewish father of that day would have taken it, and nothing for nothing, we probably wouldn't take it the same way, but tradition shows that. We would probably just thought our kids lost their mind because truth of the matter is most children nowadays have lost their mind. Well, there's a lot of amens out there. Happy Father's Day. He goes on to say to his father, you know, I, I want what is mine. It was astonishing that he would ever ask something, especially the disrespect, because in that Jewish tradition, there was a high reverence towards parents. So it would have not bode well. So you can imagine Jesus is telling this story. The religious leaders were probably like, I can't wait to hear how this is going to end. I mean, when you had disrespectful children back in the day, and these children would have been considered old enough, the Bible says in that kind of disrespect, they would have taken the child out to the courtyard of that town, out by the gates, and they would have stoned that child to death as an example to the rest of the people of the town, meaning the kids, not children, young adults. So Jesus starts with this story. He starts to set them up. And it goes on to say next, he says, and he divided his property between them. Stop right there. He didn't even say anything else to his son. Now, Jewish tradition would have meant that he would have been given one third, one portion, because there was only two sons. The oldest son would have gotten two portions and the one younger son would have gotten one. So in this case, it would have been two-thirds to the older, one-third to the younger. Now, I find this just amazing that he would just do that without even questioning his son in Scripture. So despite this, this great insult and the audacity of his younger son, the father grants it. Now, I want you to look at us. How it is. How often does God just give in to our free will? He indulges us. He says, you know what? I'm going to give in to your free will. He yields to us and he allows us to misuse our given right of freedom. He gives in to us. He gives us what we want. But he knows, and brothers and sisters, there's testimonies in here. By the misuse of that freedom, we know that God works all things out for good, and he takes what the enemy has meant for evil, and he turns it around, and he brings us back once again. Isn't that true? Amen. Kenny Hamilton, isn't that true? He's in, the, he's in the back going, amen. We have that free will, and God's given us that free will. He's not going to take it away. But it's amazing how the father in this story just indulges his son. But God understands that we will learn our lesson and come back to him. Now the story continues then in verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into, now listen to this, a far country. How often do we hear young people today, they want to get Far, far away from home. I want you to understand this. This young man is no different than, than us. He already knew what he had in mind to do with this money. And he didn't want to be held accountable. A lot of times kids... They say, I want to leave the, the home. I want to get far, far away because I don't like the rules. Well, the rules are there and are in place for any good father because they love their children. Amen. Right? People tell me the Bible is a book filled with rules. And you're right. It's filled with rules because the Lord wants to protect us, his children. 
But he says that he went to a far country because guess what? He didn't want to be accountable to anybody. He didn't want any of his Jewish brothers ever to say anything to him, but he wanted to go to a place far, far away. Sounds like a story, right, out of Disney. He had no one there to keep him accountable. Then it goes on to say that there he squandered his property in reckless living. And we learn later on by what his brother had said that we learn later that, that he had squandered his money on prostitutes and on parties and on drinking. And then it goes on in verse 14. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. Now, I can tell you this, how it went. So here he is. And let me bring it to today's term. He's hanging out in the clubs with his new friends. And he's surrounded by women because he's got what? The money. He's a baller, right? Is that the term they use nowadays? You know, come on. I'm glad you don't know. I'm sorry, but I know. So he's surrounded by all of these friends, right? And he's spending money. He's got best friends. They're wrapping them on. He's buying drinks for everybody in the bar. He's got one girl on one arm, one girl on another time. He's living the dream. That's right, until. Until what? Until the money runs out. Well, how do I know all his friends left him at that moment? Well, it goes on to say what happened next. He became in need, and nobody was there to meet his need. And then Jesus is telling this story, and I guarantee you the religious leaders are like, we're loving it. We're loving where this story is going. We want to see what's going to happen to this kid. Now, can I tell you something? The sinners... And the tax collectors, I, I can guarantee you probably started to feel shame. Because he's telling a story probably reflecting a lot of their lifestyle. And I'm saying this story to you because this could have been a lot of your lifestyle. And maybe it's still part of your life today. That we're squandering our time that God has given us on frivolous things. We're squandering the talents that he has given us on things that have no meaning. That are not precious in the sight of God. And on the day that God weighs out all the things that we do and he takes the wood and, and, and he takes those things and he burns it off. And whatever remains is, is really what matters. The things that are precious, the jewel, the gold in God's eyes. And guys, it's never too late to turn your life around. But you got to come to what? And I'm going to show you what you got to come to in a minute. This is great. So this guy, he went and hired himself out. Now, you got to understand something. He worked for his dad, but he was always the owner's son. You know how that goes, right? You're really never a worker, even though you might start low. You're always the father's kid. And so this guy, for the first time, had to go hire himself out. So we see how humiliating that is. Now, the worst of it was he had to hire himself out to one of the citizens of that country. Humiliation, number one. That would have been he meant that he had to work for a Gentile. Well, how do we know he's a Gentile? Well, because of what happened next. The guy he, who hired him sent him out into the fields to feed the what? Pigs. Jewish people would have absolutely nothing to do with pigs. They were the most unclean animal out there. But meanwhile, we make their skins into little pork rinds, and we have them as little potato chips, right? Kind of gross, but let, let's just leave that alone for a minute. Everybody loves that bacon in the morning, right? Ooh. 
So humiliation number two, he had to go out and feed these pigs. And he was longing to be fed, listen to this, with the pods that the pigs ate. I mean, it was so bad. His hunger was so much. His life was so deplorable that he, he was desiring to even eat what the pigs ate. But what they were eating was undigestible by human beings. They couldn't, we could never digest what the pigs were eating that day. And so humiliation number three, here he is. He says, on top of it, I hate pigs. I'm working for a pig owner, and I want to eat what the pigs are eating, and I can't. Can you imagine falling from the, the high status of a, a very wealthy father? And now where he is? In the mud of pigs? And then finally, he desired to eat that even though he couldn't digest it. And here's the scary thing. No one gave him anything. Jewish leaders of that day would have been good for him. He deserves what he gets. That's what the religious leaders of that day would have said. They didn't understand grace. They didn't understand mercy. And Jesus is trying to tell them, guys, I surround myself with these people because they need to be made well, and there's hope for them to be made well. But for you, there is no hope. And verse 17 is one of my favorite parts of this. But when he came to himself. Remember I said earlier? In other words, he woke up. He came to his senses. He sobered up. He found himself in prison. Sound familiar? In jail. And we're not talking about a jail like today where you get three square meals a day, full medical, full dental. You get to go to the gym and exercise and hang out. He was among the swine. He was Wretched, he was pitiful, he was poor. And he woke up and he says, how did I get here? Well, pastor, isn't this supposed to be about the Father's love? I'm getting there. I guarantee you, man, a religious leader is like, I can't wait to hear the end of this story. It says that he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's hired servants had more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? He says, I will arise and go to my father. The Jewish leaders must have loved that. Because at that moment, the Jewish leaders would have, there was customs that, that would have been implemented at this moment. When the sun arose, and I'll show you what they are in a minute. He says, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He came to his senses. He realized that he was a sinner. He came to the point when he says, I need to turn my life around. And what do we call that? Repentance. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Three things. He repented before God and before his father. We see that. The second thing we see here, he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he says, treat me as one of your hired servants. So he makes a plan. He says, I'm going to repent. I know I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. He says, treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20. This is when the story starts to really mess with the religious leaders' minds of that day. And to be honest with you, messes with mine also. And he arose and came to his father. So in other words, he got up the next day, probably a muddy, 
filthy mess, and he says, I'm going back home. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. And felt compassion. Now that wouldn't have worked well with the religious leaders of that day. Because they would not have even felt compassion. What they would have done was it would have been hard, callous, bitter, angry. But it says that the father had compassion. And the next thing would have blown the religious leaders' minds away. And it says that the father ran and embraced his son and kissed him. Now, understand this. For the Jewish leaders of that day, they would have understood there is no way any man, a true Hebrew man, would have ran. It would have been unimaginable for them even to show their ankles. They always wore a long robe. And there is no way that you can run in a long robe. You would have had to lift it up, shown more than just your ankles, and you can see the father running, and the Jewish leaders would have been appalled. And on top of that, he didn't just stop there. He just didn't stop at that moment. Come here, bud. You're too handsome to be my son, but we'll use you anyway. Can you, can you imagine this for a minute? So you stay there. You're the son, all right? And you see your father afar off, and the father pulls up his skirt, <laughs> and he comes running. And on top of him, he would have probably smelled, right? I don't know if you've ever smelled pigs before. They are stinking. He, would, he didn't even slow down to listen to his son or anything. He was so happy to see him that he wrapped himself around him as filthy and as smelly he would have been. No one, man, he's smelling like pig, and we don't do pig in our home. But anyway, you can wrap your arms around me. I'm okay. Right? He would have been like this. And then on top of him, he kissed him. Can you imagine how filthy that cheek was? Where are you going, brother? First time he's been kissed. Anyway. But listen, get the picture here. Get the picture here. (laughs) Get the picture here. I want you to get the picture here. His son must have been blown away by his father's response. The Jewish leaders are saying, this is completely unacceptable. God would have never been this way. No father would have done this way. No godly father would have done this. No godly father would have done this. First thing the son says, come on, I just read it. Can you say it to me? Oh, test anxiety. I understand. Go sit down. (laughs) That was unfair of me to put you on the spot. That's why I told you to sit down. I think you're still blown away that I kissed you on the cheek. (laughs) But I want you to see what happens. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. The Jewish leaders of that day would have fell off their seat. No, this is not how you show love. No, that's how you show love. And I want you fathers to understand, I'm not talking to you about showing love to your children. What I'm talking to you about today is the love that the Father has for you. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He starts to speak and says, he's got a third line. Remember, he's got a third line. He's got a plan, right? Just let me be like your hired people. He doesn't even get to the third line. What happens in verse 22? But the father said to his servants, bring Quickly, the best robe. Quickly, bring me a ring to put on my son's finger. 
Quickly, quickly run and get shoes for my son. See, what we have to understand about these things, the, the cloak was, was, was a sign of royalty, a sign of family. The ring was insignia. It meant power. It meant authority. And the shoes itself, no servant wore shoes. You're not going to be a servant. He didn't even get that out. And the father says, I am reestablishing you as my son. I have never stopped loving you. I've been looking. I've been waiting. It doesn't matter what you have done. You've repented. You're back to me. And I love you with an everlasting love. He didn't make him suffer. Sometimes we think maybe that would have been the way maybe our fathers would have responded to us. But your heavenly father hasn't and never will. It doesn't matter your past. And this goes for you two ladies. It doesn't matter what kind of life you may have lived, but if you've turned from that lifestyle, God wants you to know that I don't care how filthy you think you are. I am here. I love you. I'm embracing you and I'm kissing you. I don't care. My son's home. It's amazing, though, in this story, the father waited for the son this time. Sometimes that's how the, the lesson has to play out. Sometimes sh little sheep are lost or coins are lost and they can't help themselves and God needs to go out and get them. That's the one God uses us to go out and get the coin and get the sheep in the first two parables. He sends us. But sometimes they know enough of Scripture. They know enough of salvation. They know enough of what they need to do, and that's to come through the back doors of the church and fall their face at the altar. Now, I want to say something. And I'm going to be transparent for a moment. I have never heard my father say to me that he loves me. Did I know my father loved me? Yes. Because my father showed his love in different ways. There was always a roof over our heads, clothes on our back, a Christmas tree filled with gifts. Even we had, when my father went without, got up every day in the worst weather to go to work, did whatever he needed to do to supply for his family. That was the way my father showed love. Your heavenly father, now what they say is that the way we view our heavenly father is the same way we view our earthly father. So I struggle personally with believing that God loves me. Well, you're a pastor. I know. But that doesn't mean anything. I'm also his son. And it's not like I have God down here embracing me and loving me. But he does. He gives me kisses from heaven all the time. Even this story is a kiss from heaven where I can recognize that God's love, no matter how filthy and sin that I may have been in, God is willing to embrace me and to take me back into his arms as his son and nothing less. That's how much he loves us. It's an endless love. It's a forever love. God loves us so much that what? He sent his only son. What does Jeremiah say? Let me read this to you. <coughs> Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. There's no end to it. Now, what happens next kind of goes in line with the 99. It says here, after the father dressed him up, he says to his servant, without hesitation, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Now, the fatted calf 
would have been saved for a ceremonial sacrifice. Because you always give God your best, right? The fatted calf here was who? Jesus. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for my son. This son of mine was dead in sin. That was me adding on. And is alive again. I want you to look at that. And this is again, once saved, always saved, backslidden. The son at one time was in good standing with his father. The son fell away. He was dead. He repented and he ended up being what? In good standing with the father again. That's God's love. When the apostle asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seventy times seventy. In other words, there is, it's, it's, there is no number. You do it as often as you have to do it. And that's how God is with us. Now, we don't want to abuse that grace, right? Paul says, God forbid twice. God forbid twice, he says this, that we do not abuse grace. Because that's what it was. The Father was showing mercy and grace. And that's what Jesus was doing to, to the sinners and the tax collectors. He says, I went out and found them. Some of them came to me. And I have forgiven them and I will break bread with them. I will embrace them because that is what my kingdom is going to be made of. Those who truly love me. Who understand the great gift of the fatted calf that I had given out on their behalf. I, I sent my only son to die for your sins. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And it says that they began to celebrate. See, can I tell you something? When we have a repentive heart, guys, listen to me. Because some of you, maybe it's just me in this room, beat yourself up every day thinking, how can God love a wretch like me? I'm going to tell you how. I lived with this in my heart for the longest time about my father never saying that he loved me. Now, I used to say it to my dad after I got saved because we didn't say that in our house. It wasn't a big term. I started it off with my mother, love you, mommy. <laughs> I can't hear you. Love you too, Jobs, you know. It was kind of a little joke. Now me and my mother, we always say we love each other on the phone. But I'm going to show you how God gives kisses from heaven. My father went back in the hospital on a Tuesday, and I was flying out on a Thursday to see him. And I got on the phone. I said, Mom, put, him, put Dad on the phone. He had a horrible weekend. They had to take him in by ambulance. He said, I said, hey, Pop. I said, I, listen, this is Job's. I just want you to know I love you. My father's last words to any of us was that I love you. I, <laughs> I'm going to say it in his Brooklyn, his Brooklyn accent. I love you all. <laughs> it was his last words. See, God can only perform miracles like that. God knows, and I know, how much he loves me. And I want you to know how much he loves you. It's an endless love. It's unsurpassing. There's nothing like it, no matter how we screw up. Can I tell you something? Believe me, I screw up all the time. My wife can tell you all about it. <laughs> no, that's not true. I don't screw up all the time. But gentlemen, I want you to hear it doesn't matter. Now, here's the crazy thing. The religious leaders back in their day, they didn't get it. They were flipping out. But the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the thieves, the crooks, they loved the way that story ended. 
I'm a sinner. Saved by the wonderful grace of God and his love for me is endless. He comes running to me. Jackie, can you understand that? He comes running to me when I have a repentant heart. Butch, can you understand that? Running, he comes to you without hesitation, hugs you, gives you a big kiss on the cheek. That's the love of the Father, Dan. I know you and your dad got a good relationship, but the love of the Father can't even compare. And it's never ending. The love of the Father is never ending. So before we do this next song, on this Father's Day, we want to say thank you to all the fathers here who time and again show us the character of God. Thank you to all the fathers who take the time to guide and to influence. Thank you to all the fathers who show us what hard work means and how to live with integrity. Thank you to those fathers who teach us what it means to follow God faithfully and who believe in us and love us unconditionally. May you continue to have the courage and the strength to demonstrate the character of God to your children.
shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Happy Father's Day Hey, I'm going to ask all the men to come forward, please. Come to the altar. Well, you mean fathers? No, all the men. Come here. The ladies want to hand these out? Okay. We got a little gift for you guys. Why do I ask for all the men? Because every man in here, whether you have biological children or not, I'm sure have influenced other people in your life. <clears throat> and so we want to give you a little gift, and then we're going to pr- you got to hand them out, young lady. You wanted to give them out. You're all standing, looking around. See, they need direction from men. Did you see that? In your father's house. Come on up, guys. Come on. Squeeze in. Pastor John, come on. We got men behind you. I want to get everybody up to the altar. Come on. I want to say this, and I think it's extremely important to understand this. For some of you younger guys, I hope you can learn from some of us older guys. Um, and then from some real old guys, um, that, you know, we make mistakes. We make mistakes as fathers. It happens. But, but can I tell you something? Just like the story of the prodigal, you can always change and show that change to your kids and your grandkids. Remember, you, the prodigal says, I'm going to come home, I've... I've I've, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against my father, and I, I'm going to repent of that. And we can do that with our own kids. Or we can do that with other young men or girls that we've been ministering to with the gospel. Well, you're this way, you know. You ever get somebody throw, you call yourself a Christian, that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is we can always say, you know what, you're right, but I'm not that same person anymore. I've changed, and I want to be able to prove it to you. And so we have that hope. Don't beat yourself up. Hey, listen, to be honest with you, some of us are waiting, right, Mike? We're waiting for that day, right? We're waiting for that day. And until that day comes, we have to be faithful, loving God, be men of integrity, be solid in the word of God, because that's how the prodigal son. See, understand the, prodigal, the prodigal's father was, was, was God. It was a symbol of God, and this is how God looks at us. He loves us unconditionally, and he asks us to love unconditionally. So it doesn't matter how they treat us, Mike. It doesn't matter. Maybe we're deserving of it. It doesn't matter. But somewhere along the line, God is going to move, and he's going to restore. Amen? Amen? Ladies, I'd like you to stand, and I'd like you to put a hand or two to the front as we pray over these men. Father, we just thank you for these men, Lord. And we know, Father, we know, Father, today, if, if there's anything that we walk away, that, Father, you truly love a repentant heart. That you truly wash us anew, Father. It doesn't matter what sins we may have committed. If we have a true repentant heart, you're willing to forgive us and to restore us into right standing with you as your son. Father, I pray now that, that Lord, you would, you would give that peace and that hope to each man in this room. That they would recognize with a true repentant heart, Lord, you will show your love and you will restore them to the sonship that you have set aside for each of us. Now, Father, I pray that you would guide these men, strengthen these men, grant wisdom to these men. May they raise up the next generation of leaders, not yes. just in the church, yes. but in the world. Yes. Bless them and keep them, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. amen and amen. All right, give a hand for these men, all right, ladies?
All right? Now, listen, I, I'm going to get yelled at if I don't do this because I have to pray over our offering and then dismiss you. So let's just continue to pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts that your people have given to, to the storehouse of your church. I pray a blessing because this is a sign of worship in us giving. Yes. Bless the, 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 the gift box in the back, Lord, our, our offering box. Lord, bless each person that was able to give and each one that was not able to give. And Father, may we be good stewards of this money. And Father, may we use it in the advancement of your kingdom. Now bless us all as we depart for this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 All right, listen, no fellowship today. Ladies, you know you got to go home, cut the lawn, rub their feet, give them the golden, uh, golden remote control. All those kind of things, all right? Thank you, brother. Happy Father's Day to you, too. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Hey, brother, how you doing? Thanks for coming.